Thanks uh, every, for everybody uh, for joining us uh, here for the first invited talk uh, of, of, of WG. Uh, my name is Michał Piliuczyk, I will be chairing this session. Uh, now it is my great pleasure to introduce the today's speaker, uh, Vida Dujmovic. Uh, so Vida uh, received her PhD from uh, McGill's University in Montreal in 2004. Uh, and since then, uh, she is uh, mostly connected to, uh, to to Ottawa in Canada. Uh, most uh, most importantly, to to University of, of Ottawa, where she is uh, uh, currently working already for some years. Um, so when you uh, look at her DBLP, uh, she sports a, a really impressive uh, uh, research record uh, on various topics such as uh, discrete geometry, graph drawing, um, topologically constrained graphs, and uh, um, and uh, layout parameters. Uh, and in particular, uh, she participated in many uh, really exciting breakthrough results uh, in the recent years on this. And uh, today we will hear about one of them, which is uh, really exciting uh, from two years ago, namely the uh, strong product structure uh, theorem. So without further delay, please, Vida, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. I was really looking forward to go to Poland, but we all know what happened, but let's hope we are going at least in a better direction. Uh, so I'm trying, I'm going to try to do my best with this talk. It's a little bit strange but because I really cannot see anybody, including myself. <laughs> it's unusual software, but I'll, I'll try to pretend that some of you, I can see some of you. Uh, so, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, fairly new results, uh, let's say two years uh, old, as Michal said, uh, about graph product structure theory. And this picture uh, is taken a couple of minutes after we obtain the result, uh, the result that we really wanted. Although, in, at that particular moment, really, we were not even aware that we proved anything about graph products. Uh, nor how useful it will turn out to be for other problems, not just the one that we were trying to solve. So let me uh, tell you what, I, what is my goal for today. First, I'll try to give you some uh, informal statement of what we proved, the motivation, or why you should care about this result. Then I'm going to tell you about the product structure theorem for planar graphs and give you an idea where it came from and in particular where the proof came from. And after that, I'll show you some generalizations and uh, variations of these results, in particular to classes of graphs uh, wider than planar graphs. And finally, um, and, and that goes back to motivation, I'll show you an application of how easy it is in many cases to use this uh, theorem to obtain new results and sometimes on long-standing problems. Uh, so there is by now, in these two years, there's many applications to which this uh, product structure theorem has been applied. So when I was deciding which application to show, I, I went to the accepted paper trying to see uh, which would be most appropriate. And it seems of those that I did, there are at least two papers on coloring in this year's WG, so uh, I picked a coloring application. All right. Uh, so let me start with motivation and, and why you should care about this. So if somebody were to ask you to write down a, a list of graphs, you know, um, and somehow order them by how complicated you find them. And complicated can be completely loose uh, based on your own feeling. So you're likely to come up with a list like this, especially if, uh, if you ask to just put down the, the first classes of graphs that comes to mind. Uh, so you could end up with a, with a, a list like this, where we start on the top with the simplest graphs and we go more towards complicated graphs. Uh, so for sure, on the top of the list would be paths, or forest of paths as the simplest possible uh, family of graphs you can think of, then trees, then kind of generalization of trees, uh, which are k-trees or uh, there are subgraphs, which are graphs of three with at most k. Then there's lots of graph families, and maybe uh, you come to some something more complicated, like planar graphs, and then some more graphs. You end up with proper minor closed families, uh, and then bounded extension graphs. And finally, on the top of the list of this complexity, uh, you may have uh, you you would have a class of all graphs. So when you look at this list, uh, in particular for, for the, the ones at the very beginning of the list, 
paths and trees and even cage trees or, or bounded tree graphs, we know a lot. Uh, we know a lot of combinatorial results, combinatorial bounds for different graph properties. Uh, we have good algorithmic results typically for the problems of these classes. And as you go down the list, this is typically uh, not the case or things become much more difficult and complicated. Of course, again, this is a loose definition of uh, what I mean by complicated. You can just think of it as you're trying to solve a problem and on which of these classes it would be easy or difficult. All right, so given that our assumption is that the, the, probably we would be in agreement that paths and trees and even K trees are kind of simpler families of graphs. Uh, so the next family of graphs we would to consider, which is considerably more complicated, let's consider planar graphs. So what we would like to do is basically answer a question of the type, how do you express a planar graph in terms of those simpler graphs, so paths or trees or bounded tree with graphs. So in other words, uh, how can you factor a planar graph into these simpler uh, graphs? So, so in particular, what we uh, ended up uh, proving is that every planar graph is contained, meaning it's a subgraph. So if you give me any planar graph, um, I can give you a path and a graph of tree width at most eight, so constant tree width. And if you take the strong product of those two graphs, the planar graph you gave me is going to be a subgraph of that uh, product graph. So for example, here in this picture, here we have a, a planar graph. It doesn't have crossings, so it's planar. Uh, so here's a type of um, notation that I that that uh, or claim that, that I make about this graph is that it is a subgraph of a product, in this case, uh, of, of a tree with one graph of a tree and a path. So let's see uh, what that product looks like. Uh, so strong product of a tree and a path uh, looks something like this. Uh, it has lots more edges, but one can check that actually this planar graph is indeed a subgraph of the graph on the right. Okay, so let's see. So when you look at this statement, and that's what we proved, uh, there should be, there may be two things uh, that uh, you are unfamiliar with, which is what, although most of you probably are familiar with it, is what is a strong product and what's a tree width. Although the definition of tree width is really not gonna be used in this uh, talk, I'm gonna still define it. Uh, and then I'm gonna define what a strong product is. All right, so what's a tree width? Uh, so let me first uh, basically define a tree decomposition. So for a given graph G, um, to get its tree decomposition, uh, we can take a tree and then each vertex of that graph, uh, we are going to represent as a, a subtree uh, in the tree we picked. So for example, vertex B here, uh, here's a subtree that uh, represents vertex B, vertex G is this purple subtree here. And the constraint is that if two vertices are adjacent in the graph, then the subtrees uh, have to intersect uh, in this tree, in a, in, a, in a node of a tree. So for example, let's look at example here, vertex G and vertex E of the graph are adjacent. And we look at a subtree here, a G and E, they intersect in this node of the graph of a tree and this node of a tree. So that's a tree decomposition of a graph. Uh, with a particular decomposition is if you look at a tree and all of its nodes, they're typically called bags, uh, they contain some vertices of G. And then the width of the composition is you take a node that has the most of these vertices and a subtract one. So in this case, actually, each bag or each node of a tree has three vertices. If we subtract one, we get um, uh, the width of this decomposition is two. And a three width of the graph is you consider all possible three with the composition of the graph and you pick one uh, with the smallest width. 
Uh, in this particular case, actually, uh, this is example of one with the smallest width. The three width of, of this graph is two. All right, and now to the second ingredient in the theorem, which is a strong product of two graphs, A and B. Uh, so the vertices are just Cartesian product of the vertices of graph A and vertices of graph B. And here's what the edges are. Here's a formal definition. But uh, really, for me at least, the easiest way to visualize this graph is that uh, if this is a graph A, and this is a graph B, you're going to take uh, many copies of A. So as many copies as B has vertices. So this graph A, you take one, two, three, four, five copies, uh, because the, the path has five copies. So you take five copies of A, and, uh, and you do the same for the uh, for the vertices, uh, for the, you do the same for the B. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, copies of, of the path because there are seven vertices in these three. So we end up uh, with the vertices uh, of these graphs and all the edges uh, that are in A and all the edges that are in B in these copies of A and copies of B. But that's not all. If those were all the edges that are there, that would be a Cartesian product. But we're looking for uh, a strong product. Uh, so in addition, uh, you have other edges. And these edges are, if you look at any vertex in this uh, graph, and you look at uh, two adjacent edges, uh, one from a copy from a B uh, to that vertex, one from a copy from an A. For example, this one here and this one here that defines uh, four vertices so you have an edge here an edge here so we're looking at these four vertices you're going to add both diagonals uh, to the uh, to this uh, to this graph so uh, the product is going to contain all the edges in these copies of a and b's uh, plus for every two edges you're going to add uh, the diagonal edges as well. So that's a, a strong product of graph A and B. Okay, so let's go back again to what we proved, and that was uh, beginning uh, March, I think, in 2019. And uh, I should have introduced uh, people in the pictures. <laughs> uh, so it's this group here. Uh, maybe some of them are in the audience. I can't tell. Um, so let's see. So it says that every planar graph, for every planar graph, there exists a graph H of 3 with at most 8 and a path such that the planar graph G is a subgraph of a strong product of H times P. So in this particular picture, again, we have that this graph, planar graph is a product of a tree and a path. Okay, so why would you care about it? So here we come now to motivation. Uh, so, we, we, in some ways, we factor the planar graph into two things that are quite simple. One is very simple, uh, a path. I don't know if anything is difficult on a path. Well, surely something is. Somebody is going to tell me at the end of this that there are some difficult problems on path. But yes, so one is a path and the other one is a, three -width, uh, is a graph of three-width at most eight. So, this is helpful because for many problems, uh, the, the many problems are easy on tree with on constant tree with graph, and they're easy on paths. So the idea is that if you have a solution on H, uh, so graph of bounded tree with in this case tree with the most H, uh, then the solution for the product is sometimes easy. So in our case, actually, it was very easy for all but one problems, I would say, uh, that we studied. Okay, so this uh, theorem uh, not only um, taught us something about the structure of planar graphs, uh, but it gave us tools to find uh, simple proofs, and in many cases, for long-standing problems. Okay, so one of those examples is, I'm not gonna define this, I'm gonna define just the one uh, that, that one application that I'm gonna give you. And one of them is a Q number uh, that was a long-standing problem over 20 years uh, or more, um, open before we started the problem. 
Uh, Non-repetitive coloring, that's the application I'm going to show you today. Another 20-year problem that we solved using te this technique. Both of these were very easy once we had this theorem. Uh, P-centered coloring, another application. Uh, L-vertex ranking, another application. It was a little bit more uh, complicated. And finally, adjacency labeling. And by the way, in all of these cases, the results we got uh, were optimal. So were the best possible on top of everything. Uh, this one has a different color adjacency labeling uh, results. Uh, and the reason is that it is an exception uh, to this thing that I'm saying. You, you may, you're likely to get an easy proof if you find, find if you have a solution to H and if you have a solution uh, for P, obviously if you have a solution to H, you do have a solution for P, um, that you will get, an, you may get an easy solution uh, for the problem at hand. And that was not the case for adjacency labeling. It was very involved. Possibly one of the reasons is actually that all of these um, graph parameters, Q number, non-repetitive coloring, they are monotone properties. Uh, meaning that if you prove it just on the product, so H time P, uh, if you prove that graph is non-repetitive colored with, I don't know, 100 colors, then each subgraph is also non-repetitively colorable with 100 colors. So the, all these graph parameters we studied were kind of monotone on taking subgraphs, but that is not the case for this particular problem, and, and the, proof was, um, the proof is uh, very involved. All right, so, so here's some history. How did we come up with this, uh, how did we come up with this theorem? And actually it goes back to the theorem of Siebert and Pilipchuk, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it well, from a, about a year before uh, we proved our results. And it's an interesting story, actually, how it happened. Um, so you may notice from the, the first picture, we are sitting in a nice garden. And it was a workshop in 2019 um, in, in Belair's Institute in Barbados. And the way it works is, at least the workshops that, that I attend on, on the first morning, we ask everybody to pose a question. So typically, there are about 30 people attending the workshops. At least half of them ask the question. So, there is 15 or more questions asked um, on the first morning. And uh, one of the authors of this paper, of this result that I talk about, in particular, Gwen Jare, he goes on a board and says, I read this wonderful result by uh, this one here that you see. And, um, and I'm sure this has to have more application. This is great. And this is what I would like to study, to apply this result uh, to, to some other problems. And uh, five problems later, uh, Torsten got up and says, I finally want to crack this uh, Q number problem, uh, not on, on the subclasses of planar graphs and uh, things like this. I really want to go for the big thing and solve um, the, the Q number problem. And at that point, no, but at least I didn't see the connection between the two problems. And it turns out uh, that's exactly the when's question solved <laughs> this uh, Q number problem. Okay, so what does uh, the, their theorem say? It's, it's a beautiful theorem that says that for any planar triangulation, you can partition its vertices uh, such that uh, if you look at that partition and each of these color classes, uh, uh, colors uh, indicates a partition, such that, um, that uh, a graph induced by each part in the partition is a geodesic, the shortest part in a graph. Uh, so in this particular case, for example, you have this big part with four vertices uh, and it's the shortest path in a graph. Then you have some parts that have only one vertex Then this red part has two vertices and so on. So the theorem says you can partition the graph into geodesics and, um, and then if you contract those geodesics, so if you contract this green thing, this red one, well, here there's nothing to contract. The resulting graph, called quotient graph, I hope I'm pronouncing quotient correctly, the resulting graph has three with at most eight. You will notice that eight is the, the same bound we have in our theorem, and this is not a coincidence. So this is uh, the result that I proved. And here's our result uh, and the way we proved it. You will see that there is barely, that there's a very small difference in, in the statement. So here's actually what we proved, or, or rather how we proved the product structure theorem. 
there is a slight modification of this uh, statement. It says that for any planar uh, triangulation G and any breadth first search spanning tree. So it's the shortest path tree. So you take a, your root, uh, you take a, a vertex and uh, you take a tree, uh, or shortest path tree from that vertex. So breadth first search tree in that graph. Then there ex exists a partition of the vertices such that uh, each uh, part in that partition is so-called vertical path in the tree. So what's a vertical path? It's simply a path in the tree from a vertex to some of its ancestors. So this green thing, we have a path here from a leaf to the root, and this one here, we have a path from a vertex to its parent. Uh, so you have a partition to vertical paths. In another word, why they call vertical is just it looks like these paths go up. You don't have a path in a tree that goes up and then goes down, right? So there is a partition of the, the vertices of graph G uh, into vertical paths such that the same statement, such that when you contract the, these vertical paths, you end up with the graph of tree with at most eight. Okay, and it's actually this theorem that directly uh, gives you the, the product structure. I'll, I'll show you that next. But let me say uh, a few words about uh, a, a proof of this theorem. And that's actually, oh, actually, let me, for, before I tell you uh, how we prove this theorem, uh, which goes back to the previous result, actually, uh, let me tell you why does this theorem, that was my next thing, why does this imply the product structure theorem? Okay, so, uh, here's what you do. So you, you, you start with a graph, uh, you get that vertical partition of uh, width 8, um, where the, the, the portion graph, the, the contracted graph has width 8. Okay, so uh, you compute the vertical, the, the, the partition into the vertical paths, you contract them, and this is your graph H. And uh, it should have a uh, tree with at most eight. Hopefully the one that is drawn here has tree with at most eight. So you contract it, you get your graph H. So the claim is now that if you take uh, this graph H and take a strong product with a path, uh, that this graph here is a subgraph of that product. Okay, so uh, how long of a path? You should take just take the path that has as many vertices as, as the height of a tree. And so in our case, the height of a tree is one, two, three, four. So you should take a product of H and path of length four. So where is this uh, subgraph? You can just read it off. Okay, so, uh, so this part here, uh, it's, the, the, this part here, it has vertices on levels 0, 1, 2, 3 uh, of the, um, of the breadth search tree. And if these vertices of the path, you can think of them as, as being on level 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, so here's your, uh, here's, uh, here are the vertices that belong to this part. If you look at this part here, it has only one vertex on level uh, 1. So advert this is the corresponding uh, vertex in, um, in the product. Uh, these two vertices on the level one and two of the breadth first search three, here's the corresponding vertex. And then if you look at uh, the definition, you will see basically that all the edges uh, that should be there are actually there. Okay, so basically uh, this uh, partition into vertical paths, partition of the vertices into vertical paths, uh, in the breadth first search tree gives you the product uh, structure theorem. So how do we prove this theorem? Basically, this is a copy of uh, Philip Chup and Silbert's theorem and um, where you just appropriately change from shorter path to a path in a breadth first search tree. So in particular, uh, their proof has a, a beautiful inductive step uh, where in a step of induction, you are looking at um, a cycle, in particular where vertices are colored with three colors, but let's not, three to six colors, but let's not go into such details. Uh, but the main part of their proof, beautiful proof, by the way, is that 
they cover all the vertices. Uh, for every vertex inside of a cycle of a planar graph, uh, they compute the shortest path to the boundary of the cycle. So for example, for these three vertices, here's the shortest path, here's the shortest path, here's the shortest path. OK, uh, so this is how their proof works. Our proof, the only modification is that we don't just take any shortest paths to the boundary of the cycle. Uh, the way our proof works is that for each vertex, the shortest path we take to the boundary is actually a vertical path uh, in a breath first search tree. Actually, in any, it can be any fixed, uh, any fixed tree. And the root of this tree is outside of the cycle. So for each vertex, we are just taking a shortest path, so a path in a tree um, to the root. And that turns out it's a specific shortest path that we are taking. And so we are replacing in their proof shortest path to the cycle with shortest path in tree from a vertex V to the cycle. Okay, and then you check everything else from the proof and, and it works, okay? Uh, so this is basically a, a sketch of what we did for the proof. Uh, for those who have a good feelings about uh, a tree decomposition and tree width, if you look at this picture, you may get an idea why the answer is, or at least why the answer could be three, not necessarily eight. Uh, because if you think of a 3D composition of what you see here, this is really like a planar tree tree what you, the, without the missing part. So if you take a 3D composition of what you see here, it's a graph of tree with tree, and then you are doing uh, in induction on these three parts that, that remain. All right. Um, Oh, by the way, I should give a credit. These, these slides that are typed um, are made by Pat. And um, later on, there will be handmade slides. Those are made by me. Um, but this was an interesting thing. I, I asked him, what do you mean by top methods in this, um, in this uh, on these slides. What do you mean the proof via TAD method? And he told me he was in a talk by TAD who said that his favorite proof method uh, was to find proofs that say four connected triangulations, uh, replace four connected triangulations with just four connected planar graph and then check that everything works in the proof. So this is a little bit uh, kind of what we did. Okay, uh, so we also, so let's go to the now, to, so that's basically what I'm going to say uh, about the proof of this and what the main result is. So planar graphs are products of, each planar graph is a product of some graph of three with at most eight and a path. Uh, by the way, eight can be improved, has been improved to seven um, by David Wood, and I think Torsen is involved in some other, I, I don't know who exactly, but eight can be improved to seven. And um, a three is a lower bound, two is not possible. So it's not true that every planar graph is a, is a subgraph or a product of a path and a graph of three with at most two. That is not true. So three is a lower bound and we now know seven is possible. But here's a modification actually that turned out to be very useful for some application, particularly for lowering the bounds. Uh, modification, second version of this, is that each planar graph, if you want to reduce that tree width, um, uh, each planar graph is a subgraph of some graph H of three with three. And again, that's the best possible, but it's not times path only, it's time strong product with a path and strong product with a complete graph on three vertices. So this becomes like a thick path, <laughs> uh, if you like. Okay, uh, so this is, uh, and this turns out to be uh, useful in some application. And in fact, not only that, this graph H, by the way, uh, not only has three with three, it's also planar. So, so this is three bit. So, if you go back to the applications that I mentioned, if you have a, if you know a bound for the bound three bit graph, it's likely that this bound is better uh, for, if of course, better uh, if your three bit goes down. So here we went from eight to three. But in addition, if you know that this graph H is planar, you may even have a better is a better bound for that. So, so this is what we used in some of the results. Uh, if you're interested in algorithmic uh, results, uh, this is there is an uh, uh, 
Pat Morin. By the way, because Pat made these slides, that's why it says M instead of Morin. Um, I didn't fix that. There exists, uh, he showed that there is an analog and algorithm to compute, uh, given a planar triangulation, uh, to find this uh, product structure, to find H and P, um, and a mapping from the vertices to this product. And uh, there is an implementation, and, and you can find it here. Uh, so in addition to reducing tree width in this product structure, there is actually generalizations we, we proved in particular. So what's the next thing you would want to know? Okay, so the planar graphs are subgraphs of a product of a path and a graph of constant tree width, in particular small constant, eight or even better, seven. Um, so you want to know what other classes of graphs, that's a natural question, what other classes of graphs are subgraphs of a path and bounded tree with graph. Uh, so it turns out that at least that this is true for bounded genus graphs, so not only for planar graphs, it's true for bounded genus graph. And in fact, it's true more generally for all apex minor free graphs. And at least in terms of um, uh, proper minor close families, that's the best you can get. Because uh, if you take a grid, a planar, uh, let's say, n-band grid, and you take an apex and connect it to everything, uh, that graph uh, does not have, it cannot be expressed as a product of a path and a bounded tree with graph. And actually, the reason goes back to if you think about uh, the way we show this, you, you take a breadth first search tree and the length of your path is the height of that tree. But um, grid plus an apex, the height of any breadth research tree or diameter of the graph is at most three. So if this is to work, you will end up with uh, a path of length three time bounded tree with graph, but that, gra that whole graph has bounded tree with an apex graph has a grid, so it doesn't have a bounded tree. With. So, uh, so in terms of at least the, the, the proper minor close families, we have a characterizations that they have um, product structure theorem, if and only if they exclude the fixed apex. Uh, but this theorem doesn't only uh, apply to minor close families, Oh, by the way, it can be extended to all proper minor cross families if you bound the degree in addition, and then the degree is um, the plays a role in the in, in the result. Okay, but it's uh, not only uh, constrained to minor closed families. We extended this result to some um, families that are not minor close, including, for example, k planar graphs. These are graphs that you can draw with at most k crossings, drawing a plane with at most crossing, a k crossings per edge. So this one here, for example, is a one planar graph. So they have uh, they have a product structure theorem, meaning uh, they are subgraphs of a graph, of a strong product of a path, and a graph uh, whose tree width depends on k, okay? Uh, this G here is if you generalize that to graphs of genus, uh, to, to surfaces. So graphs that can be drawn on a surface of genus G with at most K crossings. Okay, so that's the motivation. Uh, so you've seen the theorem, you've seen the motivation that it allowed us to solve, uh, not, not just us, I mean, this is not uh, the, in the, uh, on this list, there are various authors involved on this list of results not just people that were uh, in the picture. Uh, so let's go to the application. Let me see how much time I have. I have enough time. So I'm going to tell you about um, how to use this result to get, um, get a new bound, in fact, get uh, answer a long-standing open problem on these non-repetitive coloring. So what are non-repetitive colorings? They come from an uh, area called combinatorics of words. Uh, where people study words or sequences. Uh, and one of the typical things that you study um, in, in, in that area is that you uh, want to, you, you're excluding certain patterns and you want to know how many uh, letters uh, uh, the, the sequence, uh, what's the minimum number of letters the sequence uh, can have without having some forbidden pattern. 
So the pattern that we want to forbid, uh, the sequence is called uh, non-repetitive. If you cannot find two consecutive blocks of the same size, such that uh, the letters in the first block are exactly the same as the letters in the second, meaning the sequence of letters is exactly the same. Okay, so you're not going to find, let's say I'm going to work with numbers, not letters, you're not going to find uh, one, two followed by one, two. Okay, so a sequence is non-repetitive if no two consecutive blocks are the same. Okay, uh, so here's some examples. So this sequence, it's not non-repetitive. In other words, it's repetitive because here we have two blocks, consecutive blocks of size three, uh, which are exactly the same, two, three, four, two, three, four. This sequence here is, is non-repetitive. It's actually not easy to see that it's non-repetitive, but it is non-repetitive, <laughs> this one here. You cannot find two blocks uh, that are exactly the consecutive and exactly the same. Okay, so um, the question is, uh, what is the, how many symbols, in this case, how many uh, numbers you are sufficient such that you can have uh, arbitrarily long sequences without repetition, so without, um, that are non-repetitive. So two is obviously not enough. Uh, let's say we only allow to use one and two, we immediately get stuck. After one, we have to put two, because one, one is already repetitive. So after one, we have to put two, after two, we have to put one, and then we're already stuck. Uh, one, two, uh, one, if we put two, we have one, two, one, two. If we put one, we have one, one as repetitive. So two is not enough. And in, um, so that's what it says here. And in 1903, two um, Norwegian mathematician proved that three symbols are enough. Uh, so, so basically that there are non-repetitive sequences arbitrarily long uh, with, on three letters. Okay, so his proof is via uh, substitution. So you can start with a non-repetitive sequence, let's say one, two, three, and here's a, a substitution that he used and proved that, uh, that it works. So, uh, if you think of this, um, you, you can generalize these two graphs, and this was done about 20 years ago. Uh, so, the way to generalize these two graphs is just to say, oh, I'm interested, so non-repetitive chromatic number of the graph, which I denote here by pi, uh, is a minimum number of colors such that every path uh, in the graph um, is non-repetitively colored. So if you take any path uh, and you check the colors on that path, uh, they, they, they form a non-repetitive sequence. Okay, so this type of coloring actually, uh, if you have a non-repetitive coloring, for example, that is a proper coloring because if you have two adjacent vertices colored one, one, well, that's already a repetition, right? It's also a star coloring. So star coloring is uh, a coloring where if you take uh, any two color classes, a graph induced by them is a force of stars. So you cannot have uh, a path of length four in, uh, induced uh, by any two color classes. But the same is true for this uh, non-repetitive coloring, uh, because if you have a path of length four uh, in two color classes, you have a repetition, one, two, or in this case, what are the colors? Green, pink, green, pink, you would have a repetition. So it's also star coloring. So non-repetitive chromatic number is at least a chromatic number, is at least star chromatic number. And all of these actually, as we know, uh, well, for planar graph, it's a famous four color theorem, and star chromatic number is also bounded for planar graphs. I forgot what the bound is, it's less than 10. Okay, so uh, by two theorem, uh, non-repetitive chromatic number of path is three. And clearly for a cycle, it's four. You can just break a cycle by any color. And interestingly, uh, there is a result that, that says that, this is just on the side, that non-repetitive chromatic number of a cycle is three unless the length of the cycle is one of these here, five, seven, nine, 10, 14, and 17. All right, um, so what are the other results that are known about this? Uh, I'm just gonna denote it by pi, and when you see pi means non-repetitive chromatic number. Um, so by two, uh, uh, two's result uh, for parts is at most three, 
And as I mentioned, this study of this uh, generalization of this problem to graphs was actually introduced by this group of people here. I'm not going to try. I think I would have difficulty pronouncing this name, these two middle names, so I'll try to skip that. Uh, they introduced this problem, generalize it to graph, and they proved that uh, it's at most delta square for graphs so of maximum degree delta. Um, and, um, and for graphs of bounded tree width, uh, it's, it's bounded by tree width, four to the, four to the tree width. And, and this is a useful result, as you can imagine, because um, tree width appears in our product uh, structure. So in this paper where they introduced this maximum, when they introduced this topic and start, gave, gave initial results uh, for the normal chromatic number, um, the authors asked this problem, uh, do planar graphs have bound non-repetitive chromatic number? And as I mentioned, the problem was open um, for almost 20 years. And we solved it with the various, I think the paper is four or five pages long, um, using once you have this theorem, it was, um, it was easy to show it. So I'm going to give you some hint of how, how we did this. OK. Um, oh, uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, what was best known for the for for the non-repetitive chromatic number of planar graphs um, about well I guess now it's approaching ten years ago uh, we up until that this point up until 2013 it was root n was the best known bound for planar graphs we got low again via let, let me call it a, a precursor of this product structure theorems. So what we uh, studied then and proved planar graphs have is something called a layered tree decomposition. And using that, we obtained this log and bind. But finally, with the stronger structure, we cracked, uh, we cracked the problem. So the answer is yes, planar graphs do have a bounded uh, path width. And as I mentioned, uh, we, we use a product structure theorem for that. So what does it say again? It says uh, every planar graph is a subgraph of a path and a graph of three with at most eight. Um, rather than tell you uh, how you do three with and it's done by somebody else, let me, let's just see how to do trees. Uh, how do you do, uh, uh, how do you non-repetitively color, color trees? So, uh, and this was observation made in the original paper is that the non-repetitive chromatic number of a tree is at most four. Okay, so the first thing you, you may try to do, if you look at a tree here, you root it. So here's the root, here vertices distance one, here vertices distance two from the root and so on. Uh, and you can think of these distances from the root as a projection to a path. Okay, and we know how to color path non-repetitively. And so in this case, here is an example of how you color a path non-repetitively. So what you may try to do is to say, okay, I'm going to just copy those colors to the tree, right? So from the projection, so root gets color one, all the vertices distance uh, one from the root get color two, then all of these get color three and so on. Okay, so what can go wrong? What does anything go wrong? If you take any path that is just vertical, it just goes up, uh, you are not going to get in trouble because it's exactly the, the non-repetitive. Uh, it, it's a path in this non-repetitively colored path. Uh, when you do get in trouble is if you are looking at the path that is not, uh, so in this case, a, a vertical path basically projects to a path in this, in this path that we used. But a, a path like this, so, so this coloring, this is another good coloring because we have three, one, three, one. So, so coloring is currently repetitive. And the reason is that projection of this path um, onto this uh, projection of this path in a tree onto this path here, well, this turns out this is not a path, a subpath of this path. It's, it's a walk in this, uh, it's a walk in this path. Okay, so we need something a little bit stronger if we are going to uh, be able to use colors, uh, non repetitive coloring of a path on a tree. Uh, you can basically try to say, I'm going to, I want a non repetitive coloring of a path um, such that a certain type of walks as well are handled. 
something we call a, a lazy walk uh, are handled. Okay, so in doing that actually um, uh, that works in our case. In this case, what, uh, uh, what worked for trees is that instead of using non-repetitive, no, instead of using not only non-repetitive coloring on a path, you also want uh, the coloring to be palindrome free. And palindromes are words that read the same from the front and from the back. Um, so, and it's easy to, to get that. You get a palindrome, uh, you get a coloring, uh, uh, for coloring of a path that is both non-repetitive uh, and palindrome free by starting with a non-repetitive coloring and then inserting uh, a color four, fourth color, um, as every third colors, okay? Uh, so if you do that, uh, uh, in this case, the, again, this was a this was a, a palindrome three one three one. In this case, you break uh, this problem and, and the four coloring. This is where this four coloring works from. So let's go uh, back of how we prove this result. Uh, so what was what what is it the theorem stated? Uh, we have a product. We want to prove that uh, uh, we have a product of a. a Bounded tree with graph and a path, and um, we want to show, and we know that these bounded tree with graphs have non-repetitive chromatic uh, number bounded, and of course that path has non-repetitive uh, uh, non -chrom non chromatic number bounded. Uh, so if we try to do uh, something similar to what was done in the trees, so we said project to a path, okay? So in this case, we can project in two directions. You project to a path, uh, and you can project uh, to a bounded tree with graph, okay? Uh, so we can take a coloring, a product of two non-repetitive colorings, a product of a non-repetitive coloring of a path, and a product of a non-repetitive coloring of bounded tree with graph, okay? Um, and hope for the best. Well, of course, some things go wrong the same way they, they did uh, that, that they went wrong in a, in, a, in a case when we're projecting a tree to a path. But here they go a little bit more wrong uh, because not only uh, you have a walk uh, in a, let's say you're looking at a projection to a path, uh, not only you have a walk, but sometimes you stay in the same ver vertex. For example, if your path follows, let me fi find it here, this edge, that in a projection is equivalent to staying in this vertex. It's like a lazy walk. So uh, what we needed is to strengthen a little bit the known results for uh, bounded tree width um, to, to handle these cases, to handle this type of, so not just the parts in the graph, uh, but also this kind of lazy walks in the graph. So we strengthen, uh, uh, so, in fact, we don't prove that if a graph has a bounded non-repetitive chromatic number, if H has bounded non-repetitive chromatic number, um, then, then H times P has bounded chromatic number, uh, non-repetitive chromatic number. We don't really prove that. We cannot prove that, at least not yet. What we proved is that uh, for every graph H and every path P, uh, if the stronger version, the one including these walks, um, it, that's why it has a star, so strong non-repetitive chromatic number uh, of the product of a graph H and a P is at most four times strong non-repetitive chromatic number of a graph H. Okay, so it depends on the strong non-repetitive chromatic number of graph H. So H in the case of planar graphs, is a bounded tree with case. So we went to this proof and applied Tad's method. You go through the proof and replace everywhere where they had a path with this type of lazy walk. All you needed is really precise definition. Uh, to quote David, he sometimes said, sometimes the solution is in a really good definition. <laughs> so uh, their proof really worked. Uh, and this stronger non-repetitive chromatic uh, number is also bounded for bounded tree graph. So if you plug in, I mean, with the same bound, because really we just replace it. So if you plug it in, what we know now, we get that every planar graph 
Uh, we know that a proof of that, that the planar graphs are bounded non-repetitive chromatic number. Uh, so the proof of that is you start with the product structure theorem. So every planar graph is a subgraph of H and a PE where three bit of H is eight and P is a path. You want to know what's a strong non-repetitive chromatic number of the planar graph H. It's a subgraph of uh, graph H and a path P uh, by this previous theorem. Uh, that's four times the strong chromatic number of H. H has three bit at most eight. And that's four to the eight. So you get about four to the nine. So it's a constant. Okay. This can be uh, improved a little bit. Um, well, quite a bit actually. <laughs> four to the nine is a big number. Uh, using that other version of product structure theorem for planar graphs that I mentioned, that every planar graph is a subgraph of a, a boundary three bit graph. Uh, a graph of three bit at most three, a path, and a complete graph on three vertices. Uh, and in that case, we have a, a little bit more general uh, result for uh, what, 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 what the bound is on non-repetitive chromatic number of a product. Um, and when you plug it all in, it really doesn't matter. Um, uh, when you plug it all in, uh, it's not anymore four to the Eight, it's four to the three, so the bound is 768. Okay, so in addition to improving all of these applies, since we have this product structure theorem, um, it implies it, it, it's valid uh, with different three bit bounds uh, for other classes of graphs. So this, this proof uh, automatically uh, works for all the graph classes. Uh, that are subclasses of a strong product of a path and boundary driven graphs. Uh, so that means uh, that graphs embeddable on a surface of fixed genus uh, have now bounded non repetitive chromatic number, the same with apex minor free graphs, the same with k planar graphs, and so on. If you want to go beyond that, so which is all proper minor clause families, you have to work a little bit more. You have to use other stuff because this is where the theorem is not true anymore. So you use some ad hoc methods um, in particular, not ad hoc methods. You use the structure theorem of Robertson Seymour to prove actually all proper minor clause families uh, have bounded non repetitive chromatic number. So all the graphs that exclude a fixed minor have bounded non repetitive number. In fact, we prove something even stronger, which is that all the graph that excludes fixed topological minor, so that they exclude a fixed subdivision of a subdivision of fixed graph, uh, they too have um, the, the bounded non repetitive chromatic number. There you are combining the results for uh, the, the graphs including fixed minor and the result that bounded degree graphs have bounded non repetitive chromatic number. So this was last year. So up until last year, we didn't know any, we didn't know if planar graphs have uh, bounded non-repetitive chromatic number. And now we know it for graphs that exclude fixed topological minor. This is a huge family of graphs. So, so it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, so that's all that I have to say about applications. I'm going to end with some open problems. Uh, you have seen the gap. Well, at least you've seen the, the, the upper bound uh, on non-repetitive chromatic numbers. So since I ended with talking about application non-repetitive chromatic number, let me first ask the question for that. There is, an, uh, there is a gap. The upper bound is 768, and the lower bound is 11 for the non-repetitive chromatic number of planar graphs. Uh, another interesting, oh, I was hoping that I added, remember that list that I started with about uh, complicated com graph order by they, by how complicated they are. Uh, one of them towards uh, uh, the more complicated size, the, the most complicated size, were graphs of bounded expansion. Uh, so an interesting problem, if you think about the non-repetitive uh, chromatic number, you the natural next question is, what are the other classes of graphs that have a bounded non a repetitive chromatic number. So now we know all proper minor clause families do and all bounded degree uh, families of graphs do. What about these uh, families of graphs of bounded expansion or rather bounded polynomial, uh, the polynomially bounded expansion? Do they have a bounded non-repetitive chromatic number? 
And in the same line, when you go to this, uh, the, to this list of graphs, you wonder what are the other families of graphs that, that are kind of, that admit some form of product structure. So for example, is there some form of product structure for polynomial expansion um, graphs? And this one I like, I, I don't know, at the end, uh, we to, to prove that apex minor free graphs um, have uh, this uh, product structure theorem, uh, our product, uh, our subgraphs of top and bounded real graphs, we use a structure theorem of uh, Robertson and Seymour, actually uh, a more refined version uh, by Zdenek and uh, um, Dvorak and, um, and Tom, uh, Robin Thomas, um, it would be great to actually find the proof that doesn't use the structure theorem. So thank you. Here are the, some of the main references that uh, some of the papers that played a major role in this talk. Um, so I, I'm going to stop at this point and I'm going to get out of this mode. Yes, okay. uh, thanks a lot. For, <laughs> now I can see great, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for the great talk. Yes, uh, it, it, it was amazing. Uh, you see already here a lot of clubs and, uh, and hearts. Oh, going thank on you. I realize these are clubs. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> So this is like oh, our uh, <laughs> and a heart. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So this is our uh, uh, way of um, of clapping online. 